Well, I want to begin today where we left off Friday night. Jesus has been crucified, and here's how the 27th chapter of Matthew concludes in verses 57 through 65. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. The next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that the deceivers said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So Jesus has died. He's been buried in the borrowed tomb of one of his disciples. The Jewish authorities knew that he had said he would rise again after three days, so they have appealed to the Roman governor Pilate to make the grave secure, and Pilate has granted their request. The grave has been sealed. A Roman guard has been stationed to make sure that Jesus stays in the grave. And then we move to Matthew 28, verses 1 through 6. Best words that have ever been written. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here he has risen, I love this next part, just as he said. Stone, you failed. Guard, you failed. Jesus Christ is risen and he is alive today. It is the most important thing that has ever happened in the entire history of the earth. And let us dispense today with the notion that it doesn't matter if the resurrection really happened or not. As some claim, the Apostle Paul understood how much it matters. He understood the importance of the resurrection. He understood it, and so he said this in 1 Corinthians, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If Christ did not really rise from the dead, we are wasting our time here today. But because Christ has indeed risen from the dead, Paul was also able to write in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day. Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. He is alive today, and he is alive forevermore. That little book that I mentioned a few minutes ago, I really hope that you will take that. Whether you're someone who has believed in the resurrection of Jesus for years, or if you're someone who isn't so sure that you believe in the resurrection. Either way, I encourage you to take that little book. It's an easy read, but I want you to get the information that it has to say. Some years I will, on Easter, talk about the evidences for the resurrection. We're not doing that today. But we gave you this little resource because believing in the resurrection is not 
some illogical, pie-in-the-sky type of belief. When one considers the evidence for the resurrection objectively, it becomes quite clear that not only is belief in the resurrection reasonable, it is the only possible conclusion from the available evidence. I love how Matthew 28, 6 says, He is not here. He has risen just as he said. It's true. It's true. Jesus has said this about his life in John 10, 18. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to pick it back up again. And that's exactly what he did. And that's what we celebrate today. One of the evidences for the resurrection is that the early Christian church was built on the proclamation that Jesus had risen from the dead. With both the Jewish and the Roman authorities having great incentive to disprove the claim, they never could because Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. And many people encountered the risen Jesus. This proclamation of the resurrection fueled the growth of the church. The resurrection was then, and it is now, the central and foundational truth of the church, of first importance, as we read there in 1 Corinthians. And the resurrection was and is a source of comfort and hope for believers in very difficult circumstances. Today we're beginning a new sermon series in the book of 1 Peter that I've simply titled Living Hope. And beginning next week, we're going to dig a little deeper into the background of 1 Peter. We might even revisit today's passage of Scripture and dive deeper into it than what we will today. But for today, I do want to look at 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9. As we begin today with this new identity for our church, this name Living Hope Church, and again, this passage is where our name came from. This passage is about the resurrection and the difference that it makes in our lives. And not only is this where our new name comes from, but this passage of Scripture lets us know why Christian hope is called living hope. You realize hope can be alive or hope can be dead. Hope can, can, can be crushed and hope... Hope can uh, be dead. It can be killed. When people lose hope, we say that their hope has died. But Christian hope is a live hope. Christian hope is living hope. And that's why Christian hope isn't just a desire, which is how the word is often used, but Christian hope is confident assurance. It's knowing what we know. And being confident that the promises of God are true. Let's turn our attention to 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9. It's a wonderful and weighty passage of Scripture. In fact, I'm not sure you can find a more weighty passage in the entire Bible. We're going to go into more detail next week, as I mentioned. But to understand the context that this was written into, let me share just a couple of brief things here. 1 Peter was written generally to Gentile believers in Asia Minor, which is essentially modern-day Turkey. The Christians to whom 1 Peter was written were part of the Roman Empire, and they were always under the threat of persecution. It's likely that 1 Peter was written near the outset of Nero's persecution of the church. And so what we're going to read was written to Christians living under the threat of persecution quite possibly experiencing active persecution. And the reason for Peter's writing was likely to encourage these believers who were facing such challenging circumstances. So that's the context. Follow along as I read 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, Strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by His blood. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trouble trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And so for the next couple of minutes, I want to share why Christian hope is living hope. Here's the first reason. Christian hope is living hope because we receive it when we are born again. Look at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Christian hope is hope that comes, we, we get it, when we are born again. Jesus spoke of the necessity of being born again in John 3. And he said that unless a person is born again, they cannot see, they cannot be part of the kingdom of God. People at the time misunderstood what he was saying, and so Jesus made it clear that being born again isn't a physical thing, but it is a spiritual thing. It is to come alive spiritually. Being born again is to have our hearts transformed from hostility or indifference toward God, and we then become people who love God and who live for God. The way that we're born again is through repentance. And faith in Jesus, which results in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. To be born again is to go from unsaved to saved. It is to go from being lost to being found. It is to go from being spiritually dead to being spiritually alive. William Barclay writes about being born again and says that when people become Christians, there comes into their lives a change so radical that the only way to really express what has happened is to say that life has begun all over again for them. Christian hope is living hope because we receive it when we're born again, when we come alive spiritually, when we receive Christ as Savior and we are indwelled by His Spirit. Now I have a question for you. Are you alive spiritually? Have you been born again? Have you received Christ as Savior and Lord? Have you been indwelled by the Spirit of God? Have you come to life spiritually? These are the most important questions we face in life. And here's an important test of whether or not you've been born again. It's challenging, but I believe it's accurate. Important test of whether or not you've been born again. Is your hope living, or do you feel hopeless? Is hope dead in you? As we see in 1 Peter 1, the hope that comes from the new birth is a hope that does not perish. It is a hope that endures. And so I re say respectfully today, if you feel hopeless, you need to at least consider the possibility that you have not come alive spiritually. That perhaps you've not been born again. 
The Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2.12 describes the world and life apart from Christ as being without hope. And so if you feel without hope, you need to consider that perhaps you need to be born again. If I can be honest with you, I believe, and Scripture supports this, that churches are full of people who look like Christians on the outside, but they've never actually been born again. We just wanted to celebrate the resurrection, didn't we? What? What's going on here? (laughs) If you've been born again, you have a living hope that nothing in life can extinguish. So if you're here today without that kind of hope, you can leave here with that kind of hope. It, It happens when you come to see yourself as a sinner needing a Savior when you recognize that Jesus is that Savior, when you repent of your sins and turn to Christ in faith, receiving Him as Savior and Lord, and when you truly come to the place of giving your life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit indwells you, you come to life spiritually, you are born again. And when you're born again, You get this living hope that nothing in life can extinguish, destroy, kill. Secondly, Christian hope is living hope because its foundation is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is hope that is based on the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 3 again, this is such a power-packed verse. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. William MacDonald writes, The resurrection of Jesus is the righteous basis of our salvation as well as the foundation of our living hope. He goes on and writes that the resurrection is a pledge that all who die in Christ will be raised from among the dead. This is our living hope, the expectation of being taken home to heaven to be with Christ and to be like him forever. The resurrection is the foundation of living hope because death is the greatest adversary of mankind and Jesus defeated death, which means that there is nothing that we need to be afraid of. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ was raised from the dead as the first fruits. That means that he was the first, but he won't be the last. And he wrote that when Christ returns, all who belong to him will be raised to life. And that's why Paul could also write in 1 Corinthians 15, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting. Sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The foundation of our hope is the resurrection of Jesus, through which death is defeated and eternal life is secured for all who trust in Christ. It is living hope because it's based on the resurrection. It is a living hope because it's based on Jesus, who is a living Savior. He is not dead. He is alive. Jesus himself, his person, he is our hope. He's alive. A pastor by the name of Joseph Garlington wrote a simple little song that expresses this well. I love these simple lyrics. My life is in you, Lord. My strength is in you, Lord. My hope is in you, Lord. It's in you. It's in you. I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength. With all of my life, with all of my strength, all my hope is in you. 
Phil Wickham wrote a beautiful song that expresses the same thing. It includes these lines, Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You've broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living hope. That's why the psalmist could write things like, you alone are my hope, O Lord. That's why the psalmist could write things like, my hope is in you, O Lord. Our hope is living hope because the foundation of our hope is the resurrection of Jesus and the person of Jesus, our risen Savior and Lord. The third reason Christian hope is living hope, because our inheritance as believers is eternal life. Verse 3 of our text says that we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It is kept in heaven for us. It is shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Verse 9 says that we are receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. When you go through 1 Peter, you understand that it's very concerned with, very focused on the second coming of Jesus and the life to come. The fulfillment of our salvation as we enter into eternal life with Christ at the end of the present evil age. Our hope is living hope because we know that what awaits every believer in Jesus Christ in the future is eternal life with Christ. It is our inheritance and it is a secure inheritance. It is kept in heaven, shielded by God's power. Our inheritance is our completed salvation and eternal life in the kingdom of God. And here's an important aspect of our salvation and eternal life that's really important for us to understand. In Revelation 21, John wrote of our eternal state, Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Our inheritance is our completed salvation and eternal life, but fundamental to that truth is that our inheritance is God himself. William Barclay writes, it is because Christians possess God and are possessed by God that they have the inheritance which is imperishable and undefilable and which can never fade away. This is why the psalmist said it, wrote in Psalm 73, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God is my inheritance. The fourth reason why Christian hope is living hope. Because all the trials and suffering of this present age cannot kill the hope of a Christian. It is an indestructible hope. It is a hope that stays alive no matter what. Verse 4 of our text tells us that our inheritance never perishes, spoils, or fades. And because we know that our inheritance of completed salvation and eternal life of God himself never perishes, spoils, or fades, our hope... Our confident assurance of those things also never perishes, spoils, or fades. Verse 5 tells us that our inheritance is shielded by God's power. And our hope in that inheritance is shielded by God's power. Our hope is protected by God when we're born again. And look at verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter writes that living hope is hope that endures suffering. And enduring suffering 
the genuineness of a person's faith is proven. Living hope is hope that endures when a person doesn't get the job they want, even though they prayed for it. Living hope is hope that endures when you pray for a friend or a loved one to be healed, and then they die. Living hope is hope that endures when your family forsakes you because of your commitment to Jesus. Living hope is hope that endures when life sends you one disappointment after another, unrelenting disappointments, but they never compromise your confidence in God. Living hope is hope that endures even when those who call themselves friends turn their back on you. And living hope is hope that endures no matter what. It cannot be extinguished. Living hope is hope that endures when others' hope has died. Christians are people of enduring hope because our hope comes from being born again. It is founded on the resurrection and person of Jesus and has a secure inheritance of eternal life. There is nothing that the world or the devil can do about a person that has living hope. No matter what happens, their hope endures. And people with living hope don't just endure. New birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ results in joyful and victorious living. Verse 6 lets us know that though the believers are facing trials and persecutions, keep in mind, likely the beginning of the persecutions under Nero, they are nevertheless greatly rejoicing. Greatly rejoicing. Verse 8 says, Though you have not seen him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Those with living hope find joy in the midst of trials. Those with living hope live victoriously even when things in life aren't going well. Those with living hope can withstand anything because of what we look forward to. Receiving the goal of our faith the salvation of our souls. Those with living hope can withstand anything because they, we, have learned that every trial is simply a test that confirms the genuineness of our faith. And those with living hope can withstand anything because they, we, know that praise, glory, and honor are coming our way. When Jesus Christ returns. These things that come from having living hope result in joy even in the midst of trials and victory even in the midst of obstacles and persecution and direct attacks from the enemy. All of this is possible because of new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is my prayer that on this Easter Sunday that you are a person who can testify, I have living hope. It is my prayer that as we move forward as Living Hope Church, that this place would be known as being a place full of people who have living hope that this place would be known as being filled with people whose hope is unshakable, whose hope is enduring. And it's my prayer that if you're here today and you cannot honestly say that you have living hope, that today you will be persuaded that hope is available through Jesus, our living Savior. And that being persuaded of that, you would turn to him in faith, You'd be born again, and you'd receive the living hope that he offers, the hope of eternal life with Christ. Let's stand. 